What's going on everyone, this is Mecha, and you are watching chapter 9 of my Farmlum 8 100% growth Ephraim Route low turn count playthrough, also known as a board Aranga plays at the 8. It's finally here, Vanessa's long awaited promotion to Wyvern. Now, as is tradition in Fire Emblem, when a Pegasus promotes to a Wyvern, they become even more ridiculous than they already are, and Vanessa is no exception. The biggest boost is to her constitution, uh, it goes from 5 to 9 which means she can now use Iron Lances without losing any speed whatsoever, and she can only lose 2 attack speed from Javelins. So from now on she is a flying delete button that can go just about anywhere and clear like an entire section of enemies, uh, most notably in a, in a route map, but Chapter 9 is a Seas map. And uh, from now on we're playing Ephraim's route, which means the main lord is now Ephraim and we gotta get him to the throne instead of Erika. This is pretty nice because Ephraim is uh, a lot less frail and a lot stronger so that will be easier. Uh, chapter 9 is one that Rangor <laughs> didn't exactly enjoy, so he made me play it the first time around, and I got a 9 turn back then. It's kind of a complicated chapter, even though at base it looks a little simple, you know, you just take Ephraim and you carry him as quickly as you can to the throne. And this got me a 9 turn last time, but it turns out uh, an 8 turn is actually possible if you clear every single enemy in the way and carry Ephraim all the way to the throne with a mounted unit with 8 move, and if that mounted unit manages to move their full move every turn and then drop Ephraim the furthest they can, then he can seize on turn 8. Uh, but this requires the removal of every enemy in the way, and this is really the crux of this chapter. There's a lot of uh, small tight corridors with lots of enemy in them, lots of enemies in there, and if you don't remove them and then your mounted unit gets stuck behind them and you lose a turn. And this is particularly pro problematic at the last section of the map, but the, the, the first bit is a little tough as well. Uh, thankfully, our mounted units are so strong that they won round almost anyone. Um, mostly friends, Vanessa and Seth, of course. Uh, Kyle and Ford have a little more trouble still, but they can do work right by now. And in this chapter, I'm going to get them quite a bit more of EXP so that they will be more useful in future maps. So, um, most of the enemy phases will just be my units just stomping the enemies. That will be the exciting part. I think the positioning is more interesting. Uh, Franz and Vanessa need to move their full move. Or rather, Franz is the one that's carrying Ephraim to that far, far point that I mentioned close to the throne. Seth and Vanessa's job is making sure that Franz can go unimpeded. And they also need to reach a certain square to reach a certain pair of enemies that are in the way. And because of that, they also need to move their full move almost every turn. But not every turn. They can lose a couple of squares, but not many. Like, um, I think it's about three for each of them. You can make up for lost squares by like rescue dropping a unit, but since the only people that can, you know, get a eight move unit further ahead are other eight move units, there's not a whole lot of room for that. So this is mostly going to be uh, trying to move your full move every turn. Now I'm carrying Ephraim along because he needs to seize and because he can do some work uh, by killing enemies. He's not weak at all, especially with the Regin Leaf against Cavaliers. And I'm also carrying Ross along so that he can go and get his promotion item. At the upper right of the map, he has a chest key that he can use uh, to get the ocean seal. Uh, something funny you might have noticed that Priest just put um, one of the scrub cavaliers to sleep. And this is actually something I rigged to happen. The reason behind it is I only have so many mend users, I think I have like 8 left, and I can only buy them at the start of chapter 11 or the end of chapter 10. So until then, I have to do with the mens I have, but I want to maximize my weapon EXP and my staff EXP for Archer. And Restore gives just as much weapon EXP as mend, so I substituted a couple of uses of mend with Restore by making this sleep hit me and then using Restore with Archer. And that way we can still maximize the staff EXP. I thought it was pretty funny. Uh, the, sleep, the Sleep Priest, he, um, he misses the first turn, but then the other two turns he, uh, he hits. <laughs> And that lets Archer just get as much staff XP as possible. Mulder and Natasha aren't doing much in the early part of the chapter because they they can't keep up at all with their five move. So there's no real way to get anyone hurt until like halfway through. Uh, that's why I deployed Garcia so that he can get hit and then get healed by Mulder and Natasha. That's his only purpose. He doesn't really do anything else except like one uh, rescue contribution. Um, this soldier that I killed on the last turn had a door key. Actually, it's this soldier. Yeah, it's this soldier that has a door key. Looking back, I think it would have been possible to save this door key and prevent a bit of a headache later by having Colm open this door and then I would keep that door key. Uh, but the way it is, I'm just using this door key here to open this door. Uh, 
I'm not sure how I would have managed to get Colm over here, but I'm sure there would have been a way. Uh, maybe instead of Ross, somehow. But yeah, uh, you might notice that I'm not being completely efficient with my combat in some of these parts. Um, the, this Cavalier, I let him live, and there's like some other enemies that I purposely do not kill. This is so that they are left behind for Ford and Kyle to get the XP from, or Ross sometimes. And then um, they can get some more XP of them while the other uh, Mati units rush ahead. There's a Horse Slayer Knight in the bottom right that didn't move and attack last turn on enemy phase, even though he does on the very next turn, which seems kind of weird. Uh, but the reason that is, is because the moment that that knight moves in the unit movement order, um, he saw that there was another enemy, so he decided not to move. Uh, but the enemies don't gray out when they decide not to move, so it looks like they would still be able to move, but they actually aren't. And that's the reason that he only attacks this enemy phase. Uh, but th by that point, Ross will be there to block the way. So yeah, there's a bunch of Shaman reinforcements that come from the lower left. It's it's only two of them, but that's enough to make sure that Garcia gets injured and get Muller and Natasha has some well-earned staff EXP. Uh, you might also have noticed that there is a um, new recruitable unit in the, in the top, that's Tana. She is a Pegasus Knight. And she is pretty useful mostly for flying, not much else. She does promote at some point, but uh, there's no way she's as good as Vanessa or Cormag. So really for her it's all about like 7 move utility. Uh, the more interesting unit of this chapter is probably Emilia who just survived. Uh, only because Franz equipped a, an Iron Blade and he's holding Ephraim. That way his um, combat is nerfed to the point that he doesn't double Emilia and he has a minimized chance to hit her. Um, Amelia gets one at KO'd by just about anything that you can use. And Amelia is also the reason that I'm using Franz in front instead of Seth. Um, my old clear had Seth in front. And I thought it was alright until I had to work around Amelia. See, the thing is, Amelia right now is in the way and I can't move past her with any of my units, so I would lose some squares. Um, but Franz can talk to her and then canto right through her, since once she's a blue unit, you can move through her and then everyone else can follow suit. And that way, no one loses any squares, so. Amelia was almost responsible for costing turns, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Um, but yeah, uh, she doesn't really do anything notable in this playthrough, of course, because she's completely garbage, even though she technically has the most to gain to from 100% uh, growth, I guess. Uh, but Ross is the more useful trainee by far. And um, there's no real use for Amelia. There's no way to promote her to Paladin in time to do anything of substance. Uh, but she's pretty funny. You know, she gets me to speed wings, I guess. <laughs> I don't usually credit people for their for their inventory, but uh, the Speedlings would be a reasonable reason to recruit her, even if I wasn't doing complete recruitment. So yeah, Kyle gets rid of the, the Horse Slayer Knight with no risk to his life, because Ross just barely managed to leave him with a little bit of HP. Uh, Ross also needs some XP still, but he's going to get a bunch in a couple of turns, because he's dropped right in the middle of like a, a giant group of enemies. He's grown to grow so buff. And Natasha finally gets her first level up, so congratulations, you now have, what is it, like, three magic? I didn't catch it because it's it's so important. But yeah, this is uh, this is not a chapter that Rengar would enjoy playing, so he, he let me play it even the first time around. I actually don't think it's all that bad to play, I thought it was fun to play out. Um, obviously it sucks if you have to restart it, but the way I record these is um, I use the VBA re-recording thing. So if I screw up, I can just load a save state and re-record without having to do the entire chapter all over again. It's pretty convenient. And if I didn't have it, I would probably lose my mind in this chapter. The throne room has another sleep priest, but he also has a physic. And he prioritizes healing enemies, so when I missed that um, mage that attacked me in his enemy phase, and he survived, I was initially kind of annoyed, but then I was happy because it, it triggers the sleep priest to use physic instead. And then next turn, I don't believe he really does anything anymore. Either I kill him or he does something irrelevant again. So yeah, on the right of your screen you can see uh, from top to bottom an archer, a knight and a mage. And the knight and archer are both in the way of a quick seize. Um, France would have to move right through them and then drop Ephraim close to where the mercenary is. And I can't do that if they're in the way. So these are the enemies that Seth and Vanessa need to reach in order to get the 8 turn. And this is impossible without a promoted Vanessa or some other kind of 8-move mounted unit. Um, so essentially the Elysian Whip that we spent a turn on last chapter, we're getting that turn right back here um, by having a promoted Vanessa to get a 8-turn instead of a 9-turn. 
But now, instead of an unpromoted Vanessa, we have a promoted Vanessa to work with for, you know, the rest of the game until we get another Elysian Whip. So in the old clear, we would use Cormag's Elysian Whip to promote Vanessa in Chapter 10. Uh, but now, instead, we get to promote both Vanessa and Cormag in a timely fashion. And this is very helpful for fast clears of several chapters coming after. So it's really nice that we found this. Uh, I'm pretty sure that having the extra promoted flyer saves at least another turn somewhere. Uh, because, you know, if we broke even, I wouldn't have had to redo this playthrough. Uh, I guess I would have to train Ross for chapter 13, but I think the cha chapter 13 is also where the other promoted flyer comes in handy to save a turn. Pretty sure you need both the promoted flyer and the promoted Ross to do that. And Ross maxes strength, completely irrelevant for the most part. He's already. He, I think he's actually my strongest combat unit at this point when you just look at Ross' stats. Obviously, the lack of a mount makes him mostly irrelevant for most maps, other than like route maps where I need like every dude possible. But later on, I'm gonna get some more stronger mounted units, so even there, he's not irreplaceable. <laughs> it's funny how much effort go to, goes into training and promoting Ross, and he ends up doing so little. I was kind of scared of the mage that friends didn't kill in this enemy phase because he's holding Ephraim, so we can't double him. But, um, because he could have moved in the way, and then I would have needed an extra mounted unit to clear him out, and obviously I don't have one of those. Um, so that was a, a safe state moment, I guess. But he ended up moving in a way where he's not in the way of a clear. Also, for Ford and Kyle, I'm trying to uh, get them EXP so that at least one of them is close to leveling up on the start of the next chapter. And I kind of screwed up somewhere. I think I got a miss that I didn't end up redoing. I think it was with Kyle. And it ends up missing them some EXP. Didn't end up mattering in the end, but it does look a little bit clumsy. But if they if they don't kill something, then you know it's either that screw up or it's because I need one of them to not gain a level up before the end of the chapter. I want him to be like 7 or 80 experience so that I have a turn 1 heal with Archer on the next uh, chapter since enemies are pretty far away. But I can't kill an enemy on turn 1 next chapter, but I can't get an easy injury, I think. Uh, note that Seth is one rounding this knight, but only barely with a javelin. This is one of the reasons I don't reject, uh, re regret giving an energy ring to him, because he's going to be doing this for quite a few chapters afterwards. And Franz actually has some issues with killing knights with uh, with an iron weapon. He would have to use like a steel lance to do it. And some knights have one to range, so you want to be able to javelin knights. And Seth can fulfill that niche. So even though Franz promoted, Seth is still the better between the two of them, and it will stay that way for the entire playthrough. Unfortunate, but don't get me wrong, friends is still good. Uh, Ephraim is using a Slim Lance here, and um, again, this is to make sure that the priest uses Physic instead of Sleep. I've had a clear kind of screwed up before. The funny thing is, I didn't even plan this uh, when I started the chapter, I just kind of randomly gave Ephraim a Slim Lance because Vanessa didn't need one. And I figured it, it might be handy somewhere. I didn't know how, I just thought it might come in handy. You never know with Ephraim. And lo and behold, it ended up making the playthrough more reliable. And now all that stands in the way of quick seas is uh, Geb. I need a killing edge crit to kill him, but it's not that tough. He has a killer axe, but he starts equipped with an iron axe, so there's no real risk here, even if he could kill me with a crit. I don't mind giving Seth the boss kill, because there is a benchmark that he needs to reach for chapter 12. Uh, I could have done it with Vanessa, but Vanessa's stats are already super good. So it doesn't make that big of a difference. I try to use Steel Lances when I can to get an S rank and weapon ranks on some units. Um, Franz has some trouble with his Lance rank actually, he can't even use Silver Lances yet, but Vanessa and Seth can easily use S rank Lances. I think Seth already has it and Vanessa is going to get it within one or two chapters. S rank and Lances is nice, it's, uh, it gives you 5% hit and crit, which doesn't sound like a big deal for units with 100% growth especially. But if you're routing entire groups of enemies and you have to hit like a bunch of them, some of them attacking you from forests, some of them using axes, you can hit, uh, you can fail to hit sometimes. So when you only have one turn to route an enemy, that 5% extra hit can be a big deal. So yeah, 8 turns, chapter 9. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.